James Hanvey was supposed to be uh, giving this paper. Um, I hope you're not too disappointed that he's not here. Um, you'll not be as disappointed as I am. <laughs> because Francesca phoned me um, three or four days ago and said, James Hanvey is ill and can't come. What am I going to do? Uh, and here I am. <laughs> This is very much a work in progress. Um, it's something that I've been working on, on and off, for some time. Um, and in this paper, I use the guidelines for discernment of spirits as set out in the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola as a conceptual framework or a tool for reflecting on certain aspects of Shakespeare's King Lear in the hope that it might give us some further insights in what is going on in the play. Ignatius died in 1556. Shakespeare was born in 1564, so they belong in the same century. I'm using Ignatius's guidelines because they offer a clear and careful summary of a long-standing tradition based on centuries of Christian experience. And I'm very happy to be able to raise this topic at this conference. I was in community with Michael Paul Gallagher for two years in the Dark Ages, 1965 to 67, studying philosophy at Heathrop College Mark I in Oxfordshire. Michael Paul was completing his Oxford thesis on the plain style in George Herbert. And although I was a raw 20-year-old, only two years out of Preston Catholic College with a B in A-level English, he asked me to read some chapters and give him some comments. I blush now to think that I might have thought I could improve his thesis. <laughs> and of course, discernment of spirits is a way of diving deeper. And we, both Michael, Paul, and I have both had an abiding interest over the years in relating Ignatian discernment to contemporary culture and to literature and the activity of reading. So it's a privilege for me to be able to put on record how much Michael Paul's work in this area has helped me to clarify my own ideas and to be a better teacher and guide. As a way into this topic, I would like to begin with a brief survey of some background assumptions and beliefs which are relevant to this study and which are likely to have been shared by Ignatius Loyola and Shakespeare. They have to do with aspects of theological anthropology, the purpose of human life, the moral order in the world, the power and influence of original sin and grace, the role of the three powers of the soul in human knowing and choosing, the relationships between reason and passion or affections, and notions of ordered and disordered affections and attachments. So some shared assumptions and beliefs which are, seem to me to be in the background here. In the spiritual exercises, Ignatius had written, human beings are created to praise, reverence, and serve God, and by that means, to come to the salvation of their souls. I suspect that Shakespeare and most people in his audiences would agree with that statement. It, or something very like it, was what they had been taught since childhood and had repeated to them in countless sermons and homilies. The service of God, included both acceptance of God's will in prosperity and adversity, and actively conforming to and carrying out God's will in their thoughts, words, and deeds. Shakespeare and his audience might not live out this idea in practice, and they might also be aware of how much they fell short of their vocation to praise, reverence, and serve God but most of them would probably agree that human life has this beginning in God and this purpose. 
Another common assumption has to do with the moral ordering of the world. Just as there is a physical order, so too it was believed there is a moral order in the universe which grounds human rights, values, duties and responsibilities. The universe is ordered by God. Human beings, in their turn, are capable of ordering their personal lives and what the Elizabethans called the Commonwealth, rightly or wrongly, in conformity with or in opposition to this divine order. It's not, moreover, an arbitrary order, dependent upon a God whose will is fickle or capricious. The order of the universe is for the ultimate salvation, well-being of humanity. Some theologians of the time saw in the world a pattern of exitus and reditus. Humani humanity comes from God and humankind's ultimate intended destiny is to return to God and find complete salvation in God. Human beings move towards that destiny by judging between good and evil and doing the good. And they put their salvation in jeopardy by choosing and doing evil by sin. It is this view of a divine moral order and the laws and customs which support it that Edmund seems to reject in his first speech in Lear. Thou nature art my goddess, to thy law my services are bound. The 2004 Arden editor of Lear comments, Edmund appeals to the law of the jungle, in effect, and aligns himself with beasts, he mentions lusty stealth, as against custom, morality and order, as a way of justifying himself. We may also note, I think, shared assumptions about the human person, and more particularly the soul, as a battleground of contending forces of good and evil. Life is a warfare. The soul, furthermore, has various powers, memory, understanding and will. Reason is the power given to human beings to direct them towards the end for which they were created namely God. Reason, enlightened by faith and aided by grace, is the guide to a life of virtue. Reason has the power and the task of guiding the will to choose what is good in the light of the end for which human beings are created. The passions or affections can constitute a further element in the makeup of the human person. In the beliefs of the time, the passions are not in themselves bad. They may work for good or ill. According to Shakespeare's contemporary, the Englishman Thomas Wright, they are both, quote, means to help us and impediments to withdraw us from our end. It is the passions, especially when they are inordinate or disordered, which hold the potential for disorder, bad judgments and wrong choices. Judgments made under the influence of disordered affections and choices which are not in conformity with the end for which human beings are created. Disordered or inordinate affections were seen to lead to disordered or inordinate attachments. The task of reason is to direct the passions, to set them in right order. Again, Thomas Wright, names four effects of inordinate passions. Blindness of understanding, perversion of will, alteration of humours and therefore maladies and diseases, and troublesomeness or disquietness of the soul. Earlier in the century, Ignatius Loyola had described his spiritual exercises as a way of preparing and disposing the soul to rid itself of all inordinate attachments. And after their removal of seeking and finding the will of God in the disposition of our life for the salvation of our soul. Good judgments and choices are made when right reason under the influence of grace guides and controls the passions and guides the will. 
Moving on to discernment of spirits. Discernment of spirits is a way of analyzing, understanding, and guiding human judgments and choices. Ignatius offers, quotation, rules for understanding to some extent the different movements produced in the soul and for recognizing those that are good to admit them and those that are bad to reject them. Literary contemporary with, lit, sorry, literature contemporary with Shakespeare uses the word spirit in a number of ways. In medicine, spirits are vital forces, influences and humors in the mind and body. Theological, moral and devotional literature portrays the human soul and its powers as subject to the influence of two kinds of spirits. These spirits are either good or evil. Good spirits are the spirit of God and the angels. Evil spirits are the devil and his minions, the fallen angels. These spirits are at war with each other and move a person in opposite directions towards the choice of the good or evil, or more subtly to the lesser of two goods when the good is enemy of the better in particular choices. The intention of the good spirits is the good of humanity, individually and collectively. The evil spirits represent the enemy of our human nature, and their aim is to destroy human good, both now and in the life to come. The spirits have power to work on reason and will in order to direct them to their proper end or to subvert them with potentially disastrous and destructive consequences. Both good and evil spirits, again according to the, the psychology of the time, both good and evil spirits cause motions or movements in the soul, the mind, will and affections. What human beings experience as the effect of the spirits are affective movements, dispositions, moods, feelings, desires, accompanied by thoughts. These movements, motions is the Shakespearean word, precede and influence memory, understanding, judgment, and will. Discernment of spirits, therefore, means paying attention to thoughts and affective movements and moods in order to distinguish between those which are good in order to act on them and those which are bad or evil in order to act, or re act against them or reject them. In other words, a human person experiences movements and counter-movements, a fundamental orientation or movement towards good, ultimately towards the good which is God, and this is the work of the Spirit of God and grace, and counter-movements luring or pushing in the opposite direction. The felt effects of the two kinds of spirit on the human soul, in Ignatius' view, are what he calls consolation and desolation. And he defines those, what he means by that in the spiritual exercises. Consolation can mean an interior movement that leads the soul to become inflamed with the love of Creator and Lord. Consolation is when one sheds tears that lead to love of one's Lord, whether these arise from grief over one's sins or over the passion of Christ our Lord, or over things expressed directly towards his service and praise. Or every increase of faith, hope, and charity he calls consolation, interior happiness that calls and attracts a person towards heavenly things and to the soul's salvation. The effect of consolation is to leave the soul quiet and at peace in her Creator and Lord. Desolation, to continue the spatial metaphor, moves us in the opposite direction. Desolation is the name I give to everything contrary to consolation. For example, darkness and disturbance in the soul, attraction to what is low and of the earth, anxiety arising from various agitations and temptations. And the result of that is a lack of confidence we are without hope and without love. We find ourselves lazy, lukewarm, sad, as though cut off from God. 
Just as consolation is contrary to desolation, so the thoughts born of consolation are contrary to the thoughts born of desolation. These states of consolation and desolation, as my metaphor suggests, are not static, but dynamic. They move us in a particular direction. Hence the central issue in discernment is the direction in which these moods and states of mind are moving a person. What are or might be the consequences of following the direction in which I am being moved and acting them out in practice? At its heart, the movement of consolation is towards an increase and an acting out of faith, of hope and generous love. Whereas desolation typically leads to a downward spiral, a focus on self, a diminishment of faith, hope and love, a loss of generosity of spirit, bitterness, cynicism and even violence. So finally, we'll have a look at discernment of spirits and King Lear. Choice and consequences, it seems to me, are central in Shakespearean tragedy. The tragedies raise issues about moral evil, its nature, its causes and its effects, and moral evil springs from human choices. The souls of Shakespeare's tragic heroes are a battleground for struggles between forces of good and evil, and the choices they make affect not only themselves, but also the moral, social, and even cosmic orders that they inhabit. Macbeth's reason and power to choose are moved by supernatural solicitings represented by the witches. Othello's actions are influenced by the deceits of Iago. When in Hamlet, much attention is given to the central character's capacity or incapacity to choose well. Similarly, the tragedy of Lear, in terms of both plot and character, is driven by the choices Lear makes early on in the play and their personal, social and political ramifications. It seems to me in the play that the evil spirits are as present and active in the storm in Lear as the weird sisters are in Macbeth. It's interesting to note, though I'm not sure how significant it is, that one of the striking features of the play is the number of references to the, to the devil, the foul fiend. Goneril is described as devil. Edgar is presented as a beggar who is tormented by five fiends. And his task is to discern and denounce them. His study is to prevent the foul fiend, <coughs> prevent the foul fiend and kill vermin. There are also several references to discretion and discernment. In Act 2, Regan tells her father, you should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than yourself. For the moment, I want to concentrate on Lear's initial choices and their consequences. Ignatius Loyola makes a distinction between two groups of people. This is important because for each group, the activity of discernment of spirits involves very different processes. One group is made up of, in the language of the exercises, people who go from one deadly sin to another. Michael Ivans, in his commentary on the exercises, glosses this as anyone whose orientation in relation to the call to renounce sin and serve and love God is one of regression even if subtle and slow. By contrast, the second group consists of people who are making serious progress, again in the words of the exercises, in the purification of their sins and advancing from good to better in the service of God our Lord. Certainly, it, at the beginning of the play, it seems clear that we have to place Lear, that if we have to place Lear in one or two of one, of these two groups, it has to be the first. A dominant feature of his character is excess. 
Kent begs Lear to check this hideous rashness. And later Goneril comments, the best and soundest of his time hath been but rash. There is little sense that there is much, much rational order or control in the passions and attachments which rule his conduct. His main intent appears to be the satisfaction of his own needs and desires, however excessive, and he is outraged when this is denied it. <clears throat> his daughters Goneril and Regan perform the role of the evil spirits by tempting him with flattery, fallacious reasoning and deceit, and attacking him where he is most weak. Lear's judgment of good and evil, his ability to discern the spirits in his own heart is skewed. Other characters comment on his lack of courage, his lack of self-knowledge and self-control. Personal consequence seems to be that thwarted of the satisfaction of his disordered passions and attachments, he is plunged into a state of profound desolation. Not only what Ignatius describes as darkness and disturbances in the soul, but also violent, destructive anger towards his daughters and closest followers, of which his curses and the cruelty of the mock trial are examples. Furthermore, Leah's choice, like Macbeth's, generates more evil. The kingdom is divided between Goneril and Regan, who use their father's terrible anger to justify their own cruelty. There is increasing division in the kingdom, adultery flourishes, and the people who represent fidelity, generosity, and integrity are banished. Lear acts out the impulses of his desolation, and the evil spirits are let loose upon the land. I want to go on just to say a few words about ways of handling desolation, if you like. A positive view of desolation as a potential source and moment of spiritual growth is a feature of Ignatian discernment, but that depends on how it is handled. The outcome may be creative or destructive, depending on how it is used. The destructive path, as we have seen, is to follow out in thought, word and deed the direction in which the desolation is leading. This is what Lear appears to be doing, both before and during the storm, in barely controlled and immoderate rage. The healthy and creative way to deal with desolation, according to Ignatius, which turns it into an opportunity for genuine growth, is to resist or act against the direction in which it is moving us. The underlying, Ignatius goes into considerable detail about ways of doing this. There isn't time for the detail now. The underlying disposition, however, seems to lie in this. A person in desolation must endeavor to remain in an attitude of patience, for patience is opposed to the annoyances which come upon one. It could be then that if there is change in Lear, the first sign of change comes even before the end of Act I, when after a violent outburst against Goneril's ingratitude, Albany says, pray, sir, be patient. And from that point onward, Lear, Lear begins to pray and struggle for patience, the antidote to his desolation. Christian, spiritual literature, Christian literature of spiritual guidance, alongside that of other faith communities, recommends the services of a wise guide or companion or friend for discernment of spirits and fostering spiritual growth. A faithful, experienced companion. Religious, Ignatius's image for such a person is that they are like a balance at equilibrium. They have a measure of detachment and freedom so that they're not sucked into the other's consolation or desolation 
in such a way that their ability to offer help in discernment is compromised or weakened. They are aware of the other person's delight or pain, but are able to stand firm in their own ground. They are committed and faithful to those whom they walk alongside, but are not interested in possessing, dominating, or manipulating them. Such a companion is especially important if a person is experiencing extremes, powerful movements of either consolation or desolation. For me, one of the beautiful paradoxes and ironies of this play is that it is Edgar <coughs> playing the part of the mad beggar who turns out to be the wise and faithful companion, the balance at equilibrium, who helps both Leah and his father Gloucester to resist and act against the destructive power of their desolation. In describing some features of discernment for people who have little interest in spiritual progress, Ignatius points out that such people are not beyond the reach of the Spirit of God or lacking the capacity for change. He writes, with people of this kind, the good spirit causes pricks of conscience and feelings of remorse by means of the power of rational moral judgment. Earlier on, I pointed to two or three traits of Leah's character, which seemed to me to be dominant at the beginning of the play. A tendency to excess in his passions, an angry insistence on having his needs and desires satisfied, and a lack of self-knowledge. In the last part of this paper, I want to suggest that there are signs that Leah undergoes change in each of these areas, or is presented as undergoing change in each of these areas. First of all, even as he begins to lose his wits, Leah begins to have insights about the world and himself that show signs of a truer and more rational judgment, a recognition of his own shortcomings and a conscience. Kneeling in prayer, he says, Poor naked wretches, wheresoe'er you are, that bide the pelting of this pitiless storm. How shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your looped, <coughs> sorry, your looped and windowed raggedness, defend you from seasons such as these? Oh, I have taken too little care of this. Meeting Edgar, a, sugar, a shivering ragged beggar, prompts the comment, unaccommodated man is no, no more but such a poor, bare, bare, forked animal as thou art. And when later still, Leah meets Gloucester, the king who had insisted on imposing his own needs and desires and power on others, shows a clearer judgment as to how good and evil and power actually work in the world. See how yon justice rails upon yon simple thief, change places and handy dandy, which is the justice, which is the thief. And a few lines later on, through tattered clothes, great vices do appear, robes and furred gowns hide all, plates sin with gold, and the strong lance of justice hurtless breaks. Armored in rags, a pygmy straw doth pierce it. As he descends into madness, Shakespeare gives him moments of truer insight into the reality of himself and the world. So some concluding comments. I'm not assuming or claiming in this paper that Shakespeare knew the spiritual exercises or that he had Jesuit connections in Lancashire or elsewhere, as has been claimed recently. There is some evidence that some of the vocabulary of discernment, motions in the soul, and ordinate or ordered, and inordinate or disordered, affections and attachments, for example, had passed into everyday speech. 
And some of these plays are found in Shakespeare's plays. Sorry, some of these terms are found in Shakespeare's plays. What I find fascinating is something very simple, the coincidence or convergence between, on the one hand, Shakespeare's intuitions about character, sin and virtue, the workings of good and evil, and the paths of spiritual growth. And on the other hand, Ignatius's rather cautious and carefully worded guidelines drawn from his own and centuries of Christian experience and reflection. What I can't explain or can't yet explain is how the two are connected. Where did Shakespeare get all that from? Thank you.